Hi everyone, welcome to this fortnightly uh, Tools of Frontline staff session. Uh, we've got um, three presentations today. Uh, and um, first up, we've got Susan from ELF, who's going to talk about her work on cost of living. So um, thanks for coming, Susan, and feel free to make a start. Thanks so much, John. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm the cost of living lead at East London NHS Foundation Trust, known as ELFT, which covers Hackney, amongst other boroughs. The cost of living project I lead is held by ELFT People Participation, which supports people with lived experience who use ELFT services. And I bring my own relevant lived experience to the work I'm doing in this role. The focus of the cost of living work I do is to support staff, service users and carers who are employed by or supported by ELFT, hopefully enabling a better quality of life, supporting people who are struggling financially and reducing stress related health issues due to money worries. I provide practical advice, tips, hacks and strategies to help reduce spend on household bills and wellbeing expenses. This information is easily accessible and intended to encourage people to take simple practical steps to action positive change. Advice and tips about utility bills, food, broadband and keeping warm for less during the cold months are my priority focus with additional support for key financial stress points throughout the year, including school summer holidays and Christmas. Additionally, how to meet healthcare costs for less with NHS support. I continually highlight two points that I feel are very important, that cost cutting can be achieved without a punitive having to go without outcome, and that health and wellbeing needs can still be maintained whilst cutting household costs. My goal is to reach as many groups of staff, service users and carers, along with their families and wider community within health boroughs as possible. This project does not offer one-to-one -one support, it is based on reaching groups of people. I deliver this cost of living support content regularly through a variety of ways, primarily by targeting group mailing lists and encouraging further circulating and passing on of content to harder to reach groups. I regularly write articles and news bulletins which are circulated by email, published on both the ELF intranet and public website and provided as digital booklets as well as printouts. My articles are also featured within newsletter publications pub produced by staff and service users within ELFT in order to increase circulation amongst other groups. For example, the ELFT City and Hackney People Participation Newsletter, which some of you may already be aware of, as it features lots of articles about local support organisations in Hackney. The cost of living support section published on the ELFT public website additionally includes designated sections of local support for each borough supported by ELFT. Support specific to Hackney Borough includes listings for food havens and warm spaces, as already published by Hackney Council. A local resources segment which highlights local support, including, for example, the charity run cooking classes provided by both Bags of Taste and Made in Hackney. And there is signposting to Hackney Council's own cost of living support web pages, as well as to other trusted advice websites. Posters and leaflets are displayed in service, user area, waiting areas to promote cost of living support available on the ELF website. I host online workshops and webinars in which I present strategies aimed at encouraging changes in thinking and approach to cost cutting and managing household budget. These include an open discussion segment for attendees to ask questions and share tips. I attend in-person ELF run public events at which I engage with ELF staff and service users as well as attendees from local organisations. At these events, I promote ELF cost of living support availability, offering printed booklets full of tips, leaflets directing people to the cost of living support section on the ELF website, and encouraging people to join the mailing list to receive content. Most recently was last month's open day event at ELF Hackney Specialist Psychotherapy Service at the Donald Willicott Centre, which some of you may have attended. I reach ELF staff across the trust through mailing lists, including staff wellbeing, disabled staff network, women's network and people participation, as well as through staff newsletters and staff intranet. I reach service users and ELF service users and carers through many different ELF services. Those who access ELF services, including people participation, befriending, peer support and recovery colleges are all on my mailing list. These services are available to service users and carers across all ELF boroughs, including Hackney. Specific to Hackney, I reach service users of ELF primary care surgeries, including the greenhouse practice and the specialist psychotherapy service at Donald Medicate Centre through posters and leaflets in the waiting areas that signpost to the cost of living support on the ELF website and booklet printouts available to read on site or take away. Using this printed material, I reach service users and carers who access services in other boroughs as well through other connections, for example, community health therapists, smoking cessation nurses and district nurses making home visits. I reach the local community through community projects and services, including the Green Sofa Project in Newham Library through a volunteer. 
parents and staff of a primary school in Newham through the school manager and the step up program run by Volunteer Centre Hackney. I also, of course, reach anyone who visits the ELF public website Cost of Living support section, either through internet browsing or signposting. My aim is to reach more groups of service users and carers, their families and the wider community. I hope to achieve this by building more connections both within ELF and between the ELF Cost of Living project and local borough organisations, services and support networks across the ELF boroughs, including Hackney. These connections can enable staff, volunteers, clients, patients and service users to become well, more aware of and to access the ELF Cost of Living resource and to assist with reaching additional hard to reach groups. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Um, sounds like you do loads. <laughs> um, so um, has anyone got any questions for Susan about any of that uh, work or things that you might want to suggest in terms of support that's available locally in Hackney? I was just wondering, Susan, how do you, in terms of like the Hackney specific content, how are you currently like finding out what's out there and what you can promote? Okay, that's a really good question, John. Um, and I'll be honest, it's um, sort of very slowly and bit by bit through, uh, usually through attending events um, and finding out about other for example, finding out about the Step Up program, that was through um, attending the Open Day at Donald Winnicott House. Before that, I didn't know about it. Um, I've actually I'm just about to get in touch with Money Hub, who I found out about recently. Um, I think that will be a really good pairing um, as they are looking at boosting the household income. And mine is about making it go further and spending less on things. So um, it really is. Um, to be honest, also, because I'm working on this project, um, solo is that and i'm part-time is that um, there's a limit to how much i can do because i'm doing two things in tandem i'm generating new fresh timely content and keeping that up to date and i'm also expanding the reach so i'm doing the two things together so i can't go herring ahead too far too quickly finding more people to support if i don't have the resource to support them with so it's kind of you know the, using the two together um, so, um, I mean, why I went into details in my presentation about examples of what I'm doing in other boroughs and what I am doing already within Hackney is to sort of highlight the different ways in which I can reach people that do work. And this isn't about just sending, you know, having somebody on my mailing list and going, well, that means that people are being reached. It's because I actually know I get the feedback or someone commits to, if you send me that, I will print it out and give it to my patients, for example. So um, so that only only then do I actually count it as I have reached a group of people. Um, so it has to be more than just, otherwise I could do a blanket mail drop to, you know, just a, a list, a directory. But I actually prefer to do it knowing each time that I've actually captured another group of people um, another demographic of people and so on. So, um, I mean, what I would say is to encourage people to get in touch with me, I'll put the link to both the cost of living support section on the trust website and also my admin email address. Um, I have a personal email address as well for work, but I'll put my admin email address um, and to encourage people to get in touch if they would like to have posters, leaflets, booklets be added to the mailing list, if they'd like to connect with me over an event that they're running and I can come and bring some material and talk to people and so on, really. That's it's sort of it's sort of ongoing networking, really. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I, as I mentioned, I'll, put, I'll come to you um, next, Karen. Um, I send out uh, the Poverty Reduction Cost of Living newsletter and that goes to quite a lot of people. So if you're happy with me to um, include your email address in that and those links, then um, hopefully that will that will um, bring about some yes. connections. Cool. Um, Karen, do you want to come in? Thanks, and thanks, Susan. That's I mean, it sounds like an amazing amount of work to do single-handedly and part-time. I mean, and uh, so hats off to you for doing that. I suppose you know it sort of sort of triggers a couple of questions. Really, is um, you know how much are you doing alone or how well connected are you into other things for example what's happening in you know with through the through the the hackney council itself is one one question you know how how closely aligned are you and do you connect and work with with others outside elf itself and i suppose my second question is is the most of the people you work with would they be staff or actually you know what 
would it be a balance between staff and patients or you know what is your client group i suppose Where do, where's the main focus of your work okay I'll, I'll answer your second question first and then your first one second so in terms of who i'm reaching um i I'm, I'm not going to try and quantify literally how many people have I reached who are staff and how many who are service users because I can't answer that question. I haven't added it up. But in terms of the effort and the um, uh, kind of equality of of intention to reach people, it's equal between staff and service users. I mean, I, both so both within the internal structure at ELF to to reach groups of um, staff, and in fact, actually now I also support the staff. The disabled staff network at NELFT as well um, but and also service users um, I know that there's more service users than there are staff but I'm you know uh, my efforts are equal because it is about supporting everybody because um, in fact staff often think oh thanks for that I'll pass that on to service users and I go well you know you can make use of that as well because that people seem to separate them you know, staff often separate themselves thinking oh you know I need to support service users, but actually cost of living affects everybody. So really it is for everyone to, to receive that support. Um, there's different channels because obviously staff within ELF have got their own staff mailing list of their own staff intranet channels. Um, but in fact, I've actually just started making the um, cost of living support website section, which is placed in the service user and carer section of the website that is now accessible readily um, to staff as well in, in terms of I've promoted it to them because really all of this information is for everybody so uh, it's not it's not focused at one or the other it's focused at everybody and in terms of who I reach it is easier to reach staff because they are going to be con you know points of contact um, and then what tends to happen is that they then uh, circulate or forward that on to the service users within their clinic within their mailing list and um, the one you know and so on um, the first question I'm so sorry I've forgotten the if you could repeat the further if you could be cap on the first one now yes it was just um how you know how isolated are you how well connected are you into other groups doing similar work such as what's happening within the council itself um you know how, what is that connection like and that sort of I suppose collaboration or support like that's, that's a really good question because um currently i mean in terms of having any connection with hackney council that's actually been really quite um recent um i i presented at a people in place hackney people in place meeting i think it was in february and that put me in contact with hackney health watch and also with john um and also at the donald winnicott open day last month i then also um was able to connect with some other people at Hackney Council who have now put me in touch with Money Hub. So um, this actually been quite recent because um, I've been working on this project since the beginning of last year. And because I'm working on my own and limited hours per week, um, and the first priority was to actually generate content to which I could then actually offer people something. And so I started off small by offering it within the people participation project, um, which supports service users at ELF and ELF staff initially, because they were people who were immediately accessible. And I've basically been radiating it out from that ever since. So um, in terms of reaching, for example, Hackney Council, that that will be now an ongoing development. Um, I mean, I have got an idea for later this year, um, I wasn't going to mention it because it's only an idea, but I'm, I'm in early conversations with various people about um, putting together a, a Hackney cost of living event, um, which would be a cross collaboration between ELF, well, myself primarily at ELF, I suppose, but between ELF and, um, and Hackney Council and other um, organisations within Hackney to come together and put on an actual public event all about cost of living support. Um, and if I could achieve that by Christmas this year, then I'd be very happy. So. I've just put that out there now, but it, it, I'm literally just in really early conversations. I've got a conversation with Health Watch about it coming up, and and you know I'll just be having conversations with people to test the waters and see, um, you know, see what the options are. But certainly, it, it, you know, mentioning Hackney Council, for example, that's definitely a connection which I intend to develop and and exploit as much as I can to reach as many people and get as many, you know. But I mean, John's been fantastic. Even I'm now getting a lot of additional information from him which i can populate our website section for hackney with because of all the different things that are there to support people that that um his team have, have kind of put together um and so you know hopefully it'll be a, it'll be a two-way thing yeah Lovely. thank you thanks uh, uh i'm gonna come to charlie is your point connected to all of that 
a little bit go to the questions in the chat first I'll come okay. in later. all right um thanks for that question Karen and um yeah great response Susan and um yeah absolutely echo everything you're saying and um yeah definitely uh, keen to continue working uh, together and if the if the um in terms of your idea of the cost of living event um if those conversations sort of get off the ground then um yeah do do get in touch with me and and my team because I think um yeah one of us at least would, would love to be in that or uh conversation and just to feed into sort of how that develops um just looking at the chat uh Felicia has asked about um I think is it IAPT in Hackney uh which I as my understanding it's that's sort of um mental health support I think by the NHS is there a cost of living link with them also I t I'll be honest I don't have any um direct connection with I apt. I'm not sure precisely what mm. what their uh, role is with, with regarding to that. Um, I mean, certainly, I'm you know, I'm open to anybody who has anything to who wants to connect with me on this at all. But I don't have any connection with them at this point. Yeah. Um, um, and, Felicia, did, sorry, Susan, carry on. Oh, sorry, Actually, no, it's no. my colleague Vicky who asked the question, so she's going to explain to you what she's seeing. Okay, um, so um, IAPT being um, IAPT Hackney, um, they they would deal with people um, of um, that are come that see them see the psychotherapists and everything else, um, and actually come into them with mental health issues. So they may have cost of living issues and things like that as well so they sh they should have a connection as well it should be a link with them as well right I, 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 I don't I'm not really very good on an acronyms what does IAPT actually stand for oh okay um independent access to psychological therapies okay so that's and that's nothing so, so that's separate from ELF does it yeah that's separate from ELF okay, yeah. okay um in that case um then that that sounds like some something I should be connected with because having okay. just Having just um, got um, um, printouts and leaflets and posters set up with the SPS service for Elft in Hackney and the yeah. primary care surgeries, then then I can do exactly, and I'll be doing that next with the um, inpatients. It sounds okay. like I should be doing exactly the same via. So, who would be my best point of contact, or, or do you want to pop it? Um, in? I don't know. I don't know. Um... Uh, that's what I don't know because there's I absolutely they're like like health watch you've got health watch Hackney health watch to Hamlet's health watch. so you've got I apt um in Hackney. I don't know I don't know whether it would be the council that would direct you to th that project wow. or not um but I don't know sorry okay. sorry no um and oh actually I've just seen Hannah's comment actually in the chat about mind yes that, i hadn't thought about that actually um and rachel's comment um yes i mean that's really interesting that you've been thinking about a live i did hear about the event that was organized i think it was in january which was i think was a health and well-being event which um i got feedback from people who'd been to that both in terms of um stalls and attendees and apparently that was a really a raging success so um i'd already been thinking about something and then when i heard about that i thought well it's it's been done once with a slightly different angle on it so why can't we do it again so um, I mean, the one thing I wouldn't be able to give is organisational time to it, but certainly I can, you know, have a big part in in the vision of it. And obviously, I will be there and providing things and everything, and and different people who I direct people to that I would like to have attend, and so on. So I'd say it sounds like I should put together a meeting at some point of a sort of bit of a think tank meeting just to sort of throw some ideas around and. Um, so, John, actually, if you'd like to send me or if you'd like to connect me up or extend it to anybody you think might be interested in coming and we'll put something together. Yeah, that sounds really good. Um, excellent. Uh, Charlie, did you want to come in still? Yeah, sure. Hi, Susan. That was a great presentation. Okay. Um, it was two things. Mm -hmm. One was just a general, it sounds like it'd be really useful to have a conversation. So in my work, I spend a lot of time looking at what's on the ground in Hackney and kind of how the kind of different barriers are coming up there around over access and access but it'd just be great to have a chat generally so i'll reach out to you um mm -hmm. and the other thing was are you aware of the estate housing surgeries that are happening obviously there's an intersection between housing and poverty some of people and i know lots of the residents want to speak to their housing offices if they are social housing tenants and there's just a link here to um, a page the Hackney Council are running where residents can speak to the housing officers directly in person throughout the borough 
in a variety of settings, be that online in community halls or in community settings like GPs or food banks. That happens every month. I wasn't sure if you were aware, but I thought I'd flag that to you as well. I wasn't, no. I, I know that P, um, Peter Bedford is um, Housing Association is on my mailing list, but I, that's as far as I've got with um, with reaching people through their housing, um, whatever, you know, housing contact, basically, yeah. But um, that, I'll, I'll take that link. Thank you very much. Um, and Hannah's put, who are the workshops delivered to? Ah, okay, that's really interesting, actually. Thanks, Hannah, because I didn't actually say that. I tried to make my presentation clear, and I missed that bit, <laughs> is that my workshops are delivered to end users. Um, so they are to service users. Um, they're not intended to... Um, sorry, they're, they're, they're either to staff or to service users, but staff as in staff as service users themselves of 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 my support if you like so it's i don't i don't run workshops for um staff or professionals to then go and and pass it on to other people the people who attend are the people who i want to support so it's it's direct to them and um, if that makes sense yes that does make sense <laughs> um so um so i have i have run some for for staff um for their own personal use. Mostly I've been focusing on service users and I'm about to actually start running in-person workshops, um, initially for people with learning disabilities who don't wish to do online workshops, but then also from that I'll roll out into workshops that are more based on community groups so I can reach more different demographics. Thanks, Susan. Did you want to come got, in? Was that another question? Oh, are they in person online? Oh, actually, I think I've just answered that bit, haven't I? You did. I just have one more question. Yeah. Do you have any when you're delivering the workshops, do you have any uh, presentational information that could be shared? I do. I, I have a PowerPoint presentation. The PowerPoint presentation is really, at uh, each slide literally has about, you know, four words on it. They're really sort of like keyword points to sort of be the, the springboard for each um, little segment of what I'm talking about. And then I illustrate it with everyday examples. Um, if it's something that's going on within ELF, uh, more so because there's more, um, scope more pathways within health to, um, to act for people to actually reach it because there's all the internal processes and newsletters and so on. But I have also a section which is um, illustrates how people can access content by the different means. And I'm also about to introduce another segment which actually talks through how people can actually um, work out their household budget um, to actually work out actually where, what, you know, what they are actually spending it on um, how much their bills are actually costing so they can actually see the real picture and then they've got something to to work to work on from there um and um actually you've, so you've got how do you outreach what what did you mean by that in your in your question one of your questions you'd put how do you outreach i wasn't quite sure what you meant by that yeah no sorry i think you've i think you've just answered that oh, okay okay that you that okay. you support in person yeah yeah it's okay Thanks, well, what's great about, so I was just going to say, what's great about yeah. the workshops and webinars um, is that it's the one opportunity I get, other than the very occasional little bit from somewhere or other, but it's the one um, source from which I actually get direct feedback from um, end users um, as to actually what, what they're most concerned about, what questions they've got, and that really feeds into then what I then create next as content. So I find that's something I find really valuable is actually being able to get direct feedback from people about what it is that they'd like answer to or help with or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, great. Does anyone else have any other questions uh, or feedback or suggestions for Susan? Carly. Also need to unmute. Just on that feedback, Susan, what is what do people tend to want to hear about most? What is the kind of feedback you've been getting from end service users about what the information is most helpful for them? Okay, in terms of things that come up in the workshops where someone will ask me a question and that will trigger, in fact, every single workshop seems to always end up being one topic. Somebody will start it and then everyone else will go, yeah, we are really. So the things that people come up is um, a lot of anxiety and also anecdotes of good and bad relating to smart meters and the benefits or the pros and cons of them and the, and the concerns people have and the lies to be quite blunt that they get told by energy companies wanting to force them onto people um also about supermarket shopping and uh, being savvy about the shopping and how people work work 
you know, work around the supermarkets to to get the best um, shopping you know, prices that they can. Um, and also um, another one was um, extra income from things like surveys and saving up loyalty points and turning that into you know money that they can subsidize and um, spending with. Um, those are the three things that particularly come to mind that are popular topics, especially for service users who perhaps are stuck at home because they're full time carers or who are not able to work. Is that being able to top up their income with um, it's surprising how much you can top up um, to help, you know, even if it's just paying for groceries with sort of, you know, you know different different ways of, of generating like the Hackney Matters, for example, the voucher scheme that they run through that and so on, um, which really help people. Um, thank you, Susan. I've got a colleague in Hackney Light and Power called Marcella, who comes often comes to this session, who I think would be interested to talk to you about this kind of this issue and particularly the fear about meters. Um, I might link you both up if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely sure, yes. Um, and another one actually that I've had um, as a popular one is about people who can't afford broadband um, or, can't, or don't have access to a smartphone. Um, and also um, is about people who um, get anxious about their heating settings and don't understand how it all works because you've got the sort of you've got the room thermostat the radiator and the boiler talking to each other and you've got the settings that you can adjust to be warm enough but without wasting money and people who get in a panic with it and end up having no heating or spending too much on it so that's another one that comes up as well thanks susan um grace did you want to come in uh, yeah, just wanted to say, um, yeah, great presentation and good to hear that um, someone's kind of in this role to um, kind of bring things together. Because um, I think there's, there's so much going on, um, but it'd be great to connect. Because uh, I work for Age UK East London. I run um, groups of old people um, and kind of cost of living, of course, is, is a big issue and challenge for them. So maybe uh, you could come along to one of the meetings. Um, to kind of give yeah i like the idea of the tips and and tricks um of how to save money yes i mean well actually to be honest in terms of like an in-person workshop i think that would be a perfect demographic because obviously the way things are and nowadays and also in terms of reaching more people more quickly is that i do rely on digital means but that mm. for people for whom digital is not a go-to um and who don't have a computer at home and so on is is I don't want, you know, I'm very aware that there are lots of demographics who, for various different reasons, are excluded from the sort of standard digital process of providing information. So certainly, yes, um, definitely would like to connect on that. And I think that's a perfect uh, opportunity for an in-person workshop um, uh, tailored, tailored to them. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, Joyce Lynn. Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, Susan, I just want to find out, uh, I run a monthly session uh, for community and one of the topics we want to look at is the cost of living. So I want to find out if I invited you to set a session, would you be interested to join to share some tips with us or? Um, yes, I mean, certainly get in touch. I mean, depending on, um, I don't know whether it's an on, on um, oh, it's, it's, you've come up with national parents, so is that a? Is yeah. that a Parents. online yes okay that's actually that's really interesting because in fact um something which i'm about to put in place is actually working with within elft um with the um families of young service users and actually i'm going to be doing a workshop for a, a workshop specifically for the families and um, so that actually ties in as another group with actually what you're doing so definitely do do get in touch with me yeah and I'll, I'll put my emails and my and everything in the chat so as and then john if you want to Put it out of there as well so we'll do it both ways and yeah so oh thank you brilliant um does anyone else have any questions uh for susan before we move on no okay um thanks so much susan that was really great and uh really glad to, be able to um make some connections here as well and um Absolutely. i mean fantastic and thank you yeah. all for all your questions because they were really fantastic ones which brought more things out about what i'm doing and also made the connections as well so that's absolutely fantastic and i'll now go on to mute and put everything in the chat for people to link up thank you perfect thanks susan um right we're going to move on to our next presentation uh we've got ben here who's from uh, uh hackney and city care center so uh yeah take it away Ben. hi everyone Thanks for having me. 
Um, Susan has segued quite nicely, actually, and, and purely by accident, in, into uh, for a couple of reasons into my presentation. One is uh, hard to reach groups, who one of which I'm here to to represent, and the other is uh, I'm just while it's on my mind, I'm going to advertise a new carers hub, which is which we're co-producing with Elft at uh, Homerton Hospital for carers of patients with long-term mental illness. So that, that is um, launching, in fact, uh, in May, mid-May, mid but I can come back to that later. So I'm here to effectively advertise uh, the needs of young adult carers who are a pretty niche group because they fall under the radar effectively um, of services because by definition they are young adults and not children so they uh, they often have been young carers from from a young age um, although often not as well um, young carers get particular interventions as you would expect from being under 18 and a level of level of support which drops off after the age of 18. And the issue with 18 to 25s who I'm working with is that they are it, it, they are suddenly faced with a situation that they have, you know, a declining level of support for at a time in their life when they do lack experience. Uh, and they it's them that needs the support. So, you know, let's put this in context. Caring is part of the cycle of life. Everyone is going to have to care for someone almost certainly in their lifetime, uh, even if it's their parents, where when you, you meet, reach middle age, your own parents are likely to be elderly and, you know, care is going to, some kind of care is going to have to take place um, by someone. When you're a young carer and a young adult carer, this has effectively been forced on you at a time in your life when you're not ready for it. And, and it's interrupting all kinds of developmental uh, stages, so to speak, educational, mental health, um, employment, right at a time when really it's you that needs the attention and instead you're having to give it to someone else, you know, on a long-term basis. And this does have a massive impact on people. So at the Carers Centre, we, we provide, I should mention, uh, that we do provide services for all ages of carers um, who are caring for someone with a, a long-term illness condition or disability but I in particular run the young adult carer service which is to essentially to pick up those young carers who are now not eligible for children's services but find themselves in a very similar predicament. The service is twofold we, we offer social support so one of the central features facing um, young adult carers is social isolation um, because it's not something that you can talk about easily. You know, you don't, when your friend is talking to you outside, you know, college or university or whatever it is, you, you know, and asking you what you're doing at the weekend, you're not going to say, looking after my mother who's got, you know, schizophrenia or whatever it is. So it becomes this sort of hidden problem, which no one wants to talk about, including the young people. And so, uh, you know, a large part of our service is about giving them a space to meet other young carers who are going through something similar at home um, and kind of hopefully create um, positive bonds through that, which they can take forward, um, you know, through through our group, which they're eligible to to be a member of for about for 10 years if they if they join us at the age of 16, which they they can do. Um, and the other side of the service, as you might expect, is more personal support. So tailored um, uh, support for things like mental health, education, employment, basically the full gamut of personal issues that can arise, you know, in a family situation. And particularly when you're that age, they've got somebody they can call and get advice and support and that kind of thing. And of course, needless to say, one of those you know the, the main issues there has been cost of living and and uh, issues associated with that so um i'm here for a couple of reasons as i say one to advertise to find out in general if people are familiar with the concept of young adult carers and 
whether anyone is working with young adult carers or thinks they might. As I said before, one of the issues is that th this is not a group that puts their hand up. So you, the only real way that they get identified is by enlightened professionals who have got the concept in their mind and are sort of proactively applying it to the people and families that they work with. So, you, you know, the people often say to me, it, you know, how do I know? How do I know as a professional whether the person or the family that I'm working with has carers or young carers, young adult carers, whatever in there? What questions should I ask, et cetera, et cetera? The answer is don't worry about that. If you're working with a family where there's long term illness or disability or condition of some kind, you can make an initial assumption that anyone under the age of 26 is going to be taken on some kind of level of emotional responsibility. So it might not be physical support. We, again, we have a very kind of rigid idea of what being a carer is. It's sort of helping somebody at the bedside, feeding them, administering medication to somebody usually who's physically, you know, incapacitated. And of course, the definition of a carer is actually much wider than that, as is the definition of illness. If you're living with somebody with a long term mental illness, you know, they're not going to be, they're not going to necessarily need physical support, but you're going to be negatively impacted by perhaps the symptoms of that mental illness um, and so on and so forth. So any families which you're aware of working with, where there's people under 26, it'd be worth making a referral uh, or making inquiries on that basis. And the other reason I'm here, of course, is to find out any ideas for cost of living support, which you might be aware of. So that's essentially the presentation. But if anyone has got any questions, um, do say. Thanks, Ben. Um, that was really powerful. And I feel like uh, I know a lot more about something which I didn't know much about before. So that was that was really good. Um, there's actually I don't know if anyone wants to put their hand up, but there are some questions. There are some points in the chat. Um, so Ruth um, has asked what ages are the young carers you work with? And she the Eat Club have got uh, funding for cooking courses with young people in Hackney. So we'd love to work with your group. Um, but yeah, I guess it depends what age they are, um, Ben. Yeah, they're 16 to 25. And they are, they'd probably be up for something like that. We're actually due to be moving into new premises where we've got a kitchen, or we're going to have access to a, to a nice kitchen where, you know, something like that could take place. Um, I won't, you know, I can't deny there's an issue with engagement in the sense that we are not a um, statutory service. So people kind of come and go as they please. Um, but that's certainly something that we would like to offer. Um, oh, and I see the, the courses, the bespoke there. That, so that looks good, yeah. Did you want to come in, Ruth? Yeah, sure. Um, I've also put in my um, email address, so please um, do get in touch. And anyone else, because we are delivering, we've got a bit of funding for young people and then a bit of funding from Hackney for anyone from 18 and over. So I think I've shared this before, so I don't want to bore people with this information. But if anyone has a group that is interested in, in us coming and delivering a focused cooking course, just get in touch. Great, thanks, Ruth. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Ben? Uh, Charlie. Um, ben, what kind of groups are you linking with around this kind of, you say enlightened professionals, and that sounds, I can agree. I just think how useful this kind of service would be as a housing officer when I used to work in that position. Yeah. I'd be interested in kind of what, where, what services are you working with? Like, what's your relationship with like youth groups around the borough who have access to those, who will have relationships with those kind of young people? Yeah. I'm going to tread carefully. Uh, we ha we have quite a good relationship with um, uh, Young Hackney, who who we currently share a building with. So we have there's a nice referral pathway going on there between obviously the young carers who Young Hackney serve, 
and 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 then you know a, a transition between their, their sort of 16 17 18 year olds then into my service everyone else you know the answer probably not great um in terms of professional relationships just because uh, well for reasons that i can speculate i can only speculate about like i you know part of my job I, i've been doing this for two and a half years now and i also I do the same kind of thing in tower hamlets actually um and uh you know a large part of my job is outreach um and a large part of the problem is doing repetitive outreach with the same people same groups you know professionals and not really get getting anything back in terms of referrals and engagement and that kind of thing so we have one so i've you know pretty diligently gone around everyone that you would expect you know school social services um uh uh, who else, uh, you know, council services who would or do on paper work with families and, and young people um, and done a lot of presentations and that kind of thing. And, it, but we, as I say, it all been received very well, but not actually resulting in any hard or many hard outcomes in terms of, you know, referrals. Oh, that's interesting. And I can see Joycelyn's raised her hand, which is really useful because I was going to say there are lots of small independent youth clubs and youth groups all over the borough. And yeah. as like the Pedro, um, so you, you as your, your group, like the Pedro Club, Joycelyn's just up the road there. So I'll let Joycelyn come in and speak for herself. Yeah. But I was going to say we can connect you with some of the ones that we're aware of as well who don't necessarily operate cool. on that statutory level. Yeah. Yeah. I think this question, as Charles have said, thank you, Charles for i think this question is for ruth and ben uh we have youth club and we want to find out how we can assess your service of cookery classes uh in today's space we have our kitchen we have a big space we've been doing it with a young uh, made in hackney uh, about two years we've been working with them but it just short short sessions so if we can have your session in place that would be very good sure um let me put my um, email. Okay. okay. Just, just out of interest, does it, does anyone here today work with families directly, or you? Susan's got a hand up. Yeah, Susan, did you want to come in? You're still on mute, Susan, if you're speaking. Um, it, um, I've lost the thread now. Oh, yes. Um, ben, thank you for sharing and presenting. That was really um, eloquent and really gave me a, a you know clear picture of exactly what it's like for 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 carers in that situation i certainly would be very happy to connect with you about cost of living and also um because something that's occurred as well is that because of course young carers have find themselves having to take responsibility for the household at a time in life when they wouldn't normally be expecting to so um all the costs of running a house you know all the costs related to running a household of bills and grocery shopping and so on that normally would fall to a to a, a parent um, may well fall to younger people. So, um, and in fact, actually, that's made me think of something which I hadn't mentioned of all the many different ways I reach out to people is that actually um, there is a service user within Elft who um, actually converts some of my tips into some things that are a lot more fun to look at and interactive for TikTok and Instagram. So um, could be a way of, or, you know, so basically there are lots of different ways of converting the same content into for different audiences. So this is something perhaps we could look at. Cool. Not necessarily the social media element, but just looking at different ways in which in which the information could be presented to to you know just reach a different audience, basically. Um, 
so yeah. any 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 guidance you have on that so we you know we could touch base on that and so or if not i can certainly put you on my mailing list to receive content and um for example i i actually I sent for just as an example, I send out content to um, someone who then picks through it for what is actually relevant for people, people who are actually homeless. And they take those tips out and they provide those on to homeless people because a lot of it obviously is not relevant because it's about having a household. And um, that's the premise of, of helping people with their household bills. So it could be that also that I forward on what I, what I produce and you pick through and choose what is, you know, what has relevance for the people you're, you're helping to support. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks, Susan. Um, I actually had a question about yeah, with the referrals bed. How uh, you might have already covered this, but how how do people actually make referrals? Like, what is that process? Um, well, officially, they do it through our web page. Yeah, but I'm so desperate. You know, I, yeah. I, I literally just take an email. Um, yeah, or, or yeah. A Google or something like that. You know. So yeah. Okay. Um, I will certainly um if you've got like some text on um that I can include in the newsletter, um okay. you know, just like a few lines or whatever, just saying, you know, what it is that you guys do and how people can get in touch. Um I can I can sort of put that uh, um, you know, at the top of the newsletter and hopefully that goes I think that goes to sort of I don't know, it's in the hundreds, um, in terms of people inside and outside the council. So um hopefully that will that will drive some traffic your way yeah. if you send me some some lines yeah okay. um councillor williams did you want to come in yeah all i was going to do was ask um sorry all i was going to ask was whether it's worthwhile sharing details with with councillors as well john but if you're going to put those details into the newsletter um i'll make sure that that backbenchers and in fact cabinet members also have Ben's details um, and what um, what Hackney and City Carers Centre does um, and the referral pathways. Um, my name's Karen Williams, by the way, I did put um, my details in, in the chat for anyone who came in after. Um, I am a councillor and I, I chair the, uh, there's a poverty reduction group of lead cabinet members across different portfolios so i i, I chair chair that group um and just popped along today to to listen to discussion um nothing more than that so thanks john i'll wait for your newsletter to come out great thanks councillor williams um genevieve did you want to come in thanks john i was just going to ask ben oh, what a tough job you've got how frustrating you know those most in need and you can't get people referred in but it's that age group isn't it um, are you talking to the local surgeries about who their patients may be that are being supported by their young people and their families? Uh, I am. I am and I'm not. I, like, I'm making contact, but getting through to the right person is very difficult. Good and, point. And, and so it's, it's, not as, it's not as easy as simply speaking to GP surgeries because you can spend a, you know, a long time on hold. Then you get through to somebody who says, I'm not really the right person. You need to speak to that person. And then they're not in. So you, they give you your, their email address. So you email them, then you don't hear anything back. So then you call and then they say, well, I, to be honest, I'm not really the right person. You need to speak to that person. Um, and so you can imagine not much progress and a little bit frustrating. There um, is an organization that um, I'm looking for the name of the organizations that sends out information to GP surgeries. Um, and I think it's, gosh, I'm, I'm going to look it up again, the local medical committees. And they contact local surgeries for this, that, and the other. We've asked to be in con They They also notify surgeries about, you don't have to write letters for your patients to get on the a housing register. It's a waste of time. What we need is X, Y, Z. So I'm wondering if that organization may help you get this message into the surgeries. That that would be incredible if if that was possible, because of, of clearly GPs are you know one of the few people who who have close access to families and and know what's going on in them. I do. I mean, I do get the impression that uh, the you know because it does require so much professional input that it's it's off putting like it, it's it's just another 
it's quite a big, it's not easy. Like you can't just say to somebody, are you a young carer? I know this service you'd be interested in. You have to go through, it's a process of helping people to even acknowledge in the first place that they're a young carer, not to be afraid to access the support because there's a huge fear, anxiety about what, you know, because broadly we are in you know social care, a social care environment and what that implies for them as a family. So it's, so it's a really big process and the systems I find that could be in place aren't in place. So for instance, I had a meeting, probably not a meeting, it was like an open day thing at um, Bart's Hospital and there were some quite senior people there and so I sort of went up to some of them in a in a slightly cheeky way to to say look this is what i do and can you help and one of the people i spoke to said oh i know what i was trying to do was i'll get a tick box on a form on an assessment form that was used in hospitals or in the hospital which said you know the tick box says is this person a young carer what well, is this person a carer and, and then is this person, you know, what age are they? And have you referred them for the following support or, or suitable support or whatever it is? And they laughed at me and said, uh, oh, you know, Ben, if only it was that easy. If only, she said, um, as it happens, our, um, you know, our senior IT person is here today. Um, but but there's just you know I'll introduce you to them, uh, but but uh, you know between you and me there's there's no way this is going to happen. And if, and of course you know that was naive. It was naive of me to to think that asking for a tick box on a form uh, you know could could is something that could happen. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it, the point is it the level of sign off it required. So, so, so it was. It was such a massively bureaucratic process that the suggestion that it could happen at all was laughable. And but this is what you're up against. So how how do you get a tick box on a form, or you know, you as a metaphor uh, for for any other kind of um, you know uh, mm -hmm. systemic, systemic change? Uh, you know what what do you what do you do? Well, keep up the good work, Ben. And I, I'm wondering if, you know, some of them will be eligible for carer's allowance. If on these social oh, media absolutely. platforms yeah. that we say, look, there is some income here for you. Yeah. Um, it, well, anyway, you know what you're doing. Good luck to you. Yeah, thanks, Genevieve. Thanks, Genevieve. And um, yeah, I, um, yeah, everything you just said, Ben, really does resonate, I'm sure, with probably everyone on the call in terms of, um, you know, you've obviously there's your specific context for what you're you're doing, but I just think in general with trying to um, you know, work through these really systemic long term problems, it does feel like um yeah, some of the processes and systems aren't um are sometimes not really a help and they're more of a, a hindrance. So solidarity <laughs> with you on on that one. Um council Ra Rachel's put something in the chat about um getting some lines into the Homerton internal com. So yeah, we, we might be able to help facilitate a conversation actually with with Annabelle Burns, who's at Homerton. Um she I can't remember her job title now, I think she's head of integration. I think yeah, oh you put it in the chat. Um so yeah, um maybe maybe we can maybe we can have a conversation and another meeting, Ben, to actually um me and and you and some and Charlie perhaps and people in our team because we we do have lots yeah, of promise everything but you know we can um link you in yeah please do come in council williams yeah. so i was gonna i was gonna suggest ben um that I, as i was saying earlier um i chair the uh, a group of cabinet lead members on all of our poverty reduction work um and one of the members of that that meeting is councillor chris kennedy and he's our health he's our lead on health and social care um so he has um direct contacts into homerton um, so um, if you drop me an email, um, I'm absolutely certain that he'll be able to move things on for you rather than you trying to um, 
um, rather than you trying to do it yourself, because I know that these things can be incredibly bureaucratic. And in terms of sign off at the very highest level, he'll be able to achieve that. That doesn't mean that will happen overnight, but I'm sure that we can try to get things moving. I all, I'm all, I also sit on, I'm a, um, a public governor on, sorry, I'm not a public governor, I'm a governor on Homerton Trust Board. Um, and so we can have a two pronged approach and possibly three pronged approach if officers want to also speak directly to Annabelle. Um, so we can work together to try and get some movement on this for you, if that would, if that will help. So that would be incredible. I'll put my yeah. I'll put my uh, email address again in the chat. But do do drop me an email and I'll speak directly to Councillor Kennedy. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, uh, Councillor. That sounds um, that's a really great offer. So thank you. That, that, uh, that sounds really good. Um, don't know if anyone else has any other questions. I'm just looking through the chat as well. Um, I think there was just one we didn't get to. Hannah has asked about the sense of the numbers and the data around young carers in Hackney. So yeah, do you have, do you have a sense of how many people? Uh, yeah, there's there's, there's there's yeah there's there's roughly two and a half. Well, no, young care. Well, okay, let me just get this right. Young adult carers is about two and a half to three thousand. Young carers, as in under sixteens, okay. as well, more. I think. Um, uh, so it's not it's not a huge number, but it's by no means a small number. And the most relevant point is we can't even reach the ones we know about. Um, and and it needless to say that that the, the figure is a guess. It's an extrapolation from from like the census because nobody puts no nobody very few people are going to say. I'm a young carer because of the implications, you know. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's this is not a simple um, a simple one, is it? Um, thank, thanks, Ben. Um, don't know if anyone else has got any other questions or comments or suggestions before we move on. Um, but yeah, hopefully some of the hopefully this has been useful for you, Ben, and you've been able to make some some useful contacts. Yes, great. Okay um okay if you ever want if you ever if you want to you know ever present um again at this meeting just give me a give me a shout but um i'll include your details and everything in the in the newsletter um great yes, cool well. no worries um great we're going to move on um rachel um you wanted to give a bit of an update on the universal credit migration did you want to come in yeah okay so and um, we've been talking for the last few sessions about um this switch over from various um what they call you know benefits such as um income support and various tax credits and people have been migrated over to universal credit and we've been talking about the need to tell uh residents about this uh you know get the message out there if people get a migration notice then they need to act on it. If they don't act on it within three months, they could lose their benefits, and uh, or, or they'll 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 lose what they call transitional protection. So um, you know some of the, the the benefits they might be actually worse off on universal credit. So um, so uh, we uh, you might have seen the. Um, email that John sent out a while back, uh, it was before Easter, but DWP did send us some um, additional information, things like contacts within job centres, which I think you'll find very useful if you are um, working with people who have got these letters. So I'm going to put that into the chat. But also the, um, the DWP has um, now released public facing information about the universal credit switchover so I'll, uh, I'll put that into the chat as well so that includes things like text that you can use um, in uh, things like uh, newsletters or websites or and then uh, I, I did actually see a TV advert as well although I, d I have to say I didn't find it particularly clear it seemed quite abstract to me. It didn't really get the message across to me about, you know, the need for people to act and 
you know, take take action it, and they might l lose their benefits. But it's also I'm seeing very sort of cosy and just felt felt very abstract. But um, but in addition to that, though, as a council, we are starting to do some communications of our own, and um, we've developed. Um, we're going to put an uh, an article in uh, Love Hackney that goes out to all of Hackney residents, but. Our comms team has developed some Facebook ads, uh, some tweets, and a short article in the e newsletter. And yeah, so I'm going to share that with you as well because I think it'd be really useful. I know some of you do repurpose this information and you know you use it for your own newsletters or your own tweets and things like that. So please do. Um, you know, please do use that information. If you see any comms from the council on Facebook or Twitter, please retweet. Please feel free to use any of that material. And I think what we'll do is we'll just have to see how things go. I think there will be a need for information in... Um, we, uh, we are working with the communication team on a comms plan. They are looking at some targeted advertisements on things like Facebook, so they can target people with specific language languages who say they speak specific languages like Turkish and Kurdish. And they have done that in the past, and it's been quite successful. They have reached quite a few people, so they want to experiment with different ways of doing things. But I think we we might need, you know, tailored information at specific communities, particularly or communities that are li linguistically excluded or you know people who need accessible information. But I think one of the most you know, we can do leaflets, posters, um, social media, etc. But I think people take most notice of information when it comes from a trusted source. So if it comes from you via WhatsApp message or via your Facebook groups or whatever, I think people are more likely to look at it. So please do feel free to use that information. And we, you know, we'll obviously be coming back to this and, and we'll be updating with, with information. And it, the letters start to go out um, on... Uh, Tuesday, so the 9th, so people should start receiving them next week. And, you know, a big tranche of, you know, the, the biggest batch of uh, migrations will be the, in these first couple of months. So from sort of May, April, May, June, July, that kind of thing. So just be aware. And if people do come to you, that, you know, there's also information about sources of support. I'd say don't don't attempt to advise people yourselves. Um, you know, if you're not a benefit specialist, please do, um, you know, direct people to help to claim or uh, which is run by the um, Citizens Advice Bureau or, you know, contact to the job centre itself or, you know, refer them to a reputable advice service locally. So I think that's that's really all I've, I can say at the moment. Thanks, Rachel. Um, Joyce Lynn, did you want to come in? Yeah, Rachel, um, I had a few people this week that was um, not clear if they have to change their mm. um, job sick allowance and um, what else again they have, uh, job sick allowance, income support. Um, they were not sure if they have to um, change it to universal credit. Mm. And um, like you said, I'm not a <laughs> specialist, so... I told them to go back because some of them was just coming back from signing and so they were not told some of them they said they will inform them later which i knew that last month most people have received a letter to start signing in for universal credit yeah so they're telling me that they were not told when they went to sign in i was a little bit confused so i asked them to go back to job center to find out more because i know that there will be a time is everything is going to close down and they are going to lose some uh, benefit so um they should go back and ask so is it anything that maybe job center have to do or do yeah so they will get a letter so they shouldn't go apply for universal credit until they get a letter and then they must follow the instructions on the letter now they have to apply online which for a lot of people is quite difficult. I actually had to make a universal credit application myself a couple of years ago because my partner was not working and um, you have to apply as a couple. And I personally found it quite a difficult um, system to navigate and I'm quite used to working with computers. I thought that the way the, the, um, 
the questions were worded. I don't know if they've improved, but they didn't seem to be very, I don't know who they test these things on. So that is a concern that people won't be able to go online and they will struggle. Although this help to claim the service is supposed to help people to, you know, to, to apply. So they need, they do need to wait for the letters though. So not to kind of jump the gun and apply for universal credit. Cause again, they could then be seen as a fresh claim and then they'd use their, lose their um, transitional support. So they'd lose some of the benefits that, you know, cause they might be better off on some of their existing benefits and they will get those, what they call transitional protection. So tell them not to apply for universal credit until they get that letter and to follow the instructions on that letter. Okay. Uh, yeah. I recently also did the joint application. It took me two days, but at mm. the end of the day, um, they give them a specific time. Mm. If they don't finish it in that time, everything's going to wipe up. They have, we have to reset it again. Whereas okay. we operate only two days a week. So yeah. after Tuesday, <laughs> Tuesday was not possible. I can do it for her on Wednesday. Yeah. Wednesday she has to, I started it after she finished work. I can't finish it. Yet then again, I have to spend extra day to finish it with her because if not, everything's going to be wiped off for us to reset it again. Oh, so okay. I don't know. I know you are not in a position to do but is there anything they can do? Because once they're depending on us, we're also working with time and it's difficult to put pressure on us to work extra and go extra mass to assist yeah. them. Thank you for raising that, um, uh, Jocelyn. And, and I think we should be using these sessions to get feedback as we're going. And what I've done as well, and I'll share this with you, is I've set, I've st set up a sort of issues log because we're meeting with the DWP every month. And, um, you know, what I'd like to do is go through this log with them and try and get them to resolve, you know, any issues that come up as they come up. So I'm going to I'm going to add this what you've just said to the log yeah. and um, get them to to provide a response. So thank you for raising that because I I do know the application process is quite tricky just from personal experience. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Joyce Lynn. That's really useful. Um, Susan. Hi, yeah, um, I just uh, I saw something in the chat um, about um, only applying if you when you get the migration letter to only apply if your legacy benefits are all in order. So if someone has, is on legacy benefits, gets their migration letter and their legacy benefit, let's say they're owed some arrears or there's some, you know, something is unresolved with the benefits that, that um, they're entitled to at that point. Does that mean then that they shouldn't? Because I haven't heard anything about this. Um, or, I think someone's going to answer me. I don't know. I I would just I I wouldn't be able to answer that. I don't know if anybody could answer that. But uh, yeah, go on, Shahidul. You you will be able to answer. Go on. I uh, sorry, I posted that comment. Um, basically, what happened was uh, a number of months back, the DW sent out a um, leaflet saying tax credits are ending. A lot of people took that as like a migration notice, and they started applying for. Oh, uh, yeah. universal credit so what happens is if you apply for universal credit outside uh if you, if you haven't got the letter and you apply for universal credit you're outside of the migration process so you lose out any sort of um, transitional protection so mm -hmm. if your legacy benefits the old benefits are all in order you have no issues with that there's no need for you to make a claim for universal credit so let's say like um just being a change of circumstance and that takes you out of uh, the legacy benefit system before you get the migration noise and you need to claim universal credit because you need money then you should claim universal credit but if your legacy benefits and it uh, is in all in order there's no issues uh, and you haven't got the migration notice you shouldn't apply for universal credit because that takes you outside of the migration process which means you get outside of the transitional protection so main message is wait for the letter to come uh, if everything is okay in terms of claiming benefits but if you need to claim because your legacy benefits got cancelled because for whatever change of circumstance then you should make a claim okay i hope that's clear yeah thank you thanks thanks shahido thanks shahido um rachel is me going to um come to this meeting again do you think well yeah we 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 definitely want to encourage her to do that don't we so think yeah. um i mean if she, i think you might be worth inviting her 
Yeah. Um, well, to the next one, even having a slot with her, because yeah. by then people will have started to get the letters. So yeah. there might actually be something to, to feed back to her on. Because she has said that she'd be happy yeah. to come as well. So I yeah. think um, you know, an approach from you would be would yeah. be helpful for next session. Sounds good. Yeah. Cool. Um yeah, as you say, we'll just have to keep um keep keep sharing the information we've got in these meetings and, uh, and elsewhere um does anyone else have any questions for rachel or, or Shahid or on on the uc stuff no okay um we've got about 10 minutes left um so uh does anyone have any questions or things they want to raise or things they want to promote um or, or to share now um just before we we wrap up no okay um oh charlie i'll just reiterate because i do so i want to say every time because we know housing is a huge issue across lots of the lots of the borough if you if you have any residents that have any housing tenants they can book to see the housing officer via the estate surgery site it's not perfect joycelyn and i both know that but there are there are lots of attempts to try and do it across the borough so and if it isn't working and people are turning up and it isn't happening tell us so we can let people know that's just my flag. I put I posted the link earlier. I could post it again. Great, thanks, Charlie. Uh, Hannah, your hand was up for about 0 0.1 seconds. Do you still want to say something? It was, and now I'm not sure if this is the place, but I'll, I'll ask anyway. Rachel, yeah. I did, I did um, ask you before, and I don't know if this is a space to, to answer this or if there is a if there is an answer. Um, but it was about the the UC migration and um, because I know there were questions around how that information would be would go to residents and I think it's it's through letters predominantly that's that's the way and I know that obviously with people who are living residents living in temporary accommodation hostels and, and dispersed housing that there's an issue around that information getting to them and I, I think could you yeah, sorry, Hannah, just to say, people in temporary accommodation, they shouldn't be migrating, so they shouldn't be getting letters. So, but um, it's up to the local authorities to keep their records up to date, and there should be a flag to say that person is in temporary accommodation. And when I went to the uh, meeting with the DWP, they were saying to local authorities, you must keep your information up to date. You must um... Now, there is a danger that somebody perhaps the, that those records are not up to date and the flag isn't there and they get a letter but they shouldn't be getting a letter so if people do come across people in temporary accommodation and they get a letter they shouldn't so perhaps that's a, a case where people need to get a hold of the dwp and uh, local job center and tell them that that person shouldn't have a letter or maybe even um, the council to get them to update their records so yeah that's that is definitely a case that you shouldn't be getting a letter even if you're on these benefits you shouldn't be getting a letter and if you're in in uh, local authority supported temporary accommodation okay thank you that's really really yeah. helpful so, okay. so they won't be expected to migrate at all no no they won't no if they're in you know official you know if if it's obviously somebody who's just living somewhere temporarily at a friend's house or something that's different but if they're in temporary accommodation in a hostel or so they've been placed there by the local authority they shouldn't have to migrate thank you rachel yeah 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 great thanks guys um does anyone else have any comments or questions no um i think uh Oh, Pauline's just putting up something in the chat. So, TA pension residents and uh, supported accommodation, the only groups who will remain on have to benefit. Right. Thanks for the clarification, Pauline. Um, I think before we wrap up, uh, Councillor Williams, did you want to say a quick word? Um, I, I guess the only thing really left to say is, is thank you to you, John, for continuing to organise and host these meetings, keeping it going, getting speakers and ensuring that relevant cabinet members also um, come along to, from time to time. I know we don't get here as, as frequently as you would like us to, um, but we do recognise the invaluable work that is done in this forum and the need for it as well, um, and the partnership approach. I think that came across very, very clearly um, today. Not only is it a space to share information about what your 
individual organisations are all doing, but how you can continue to work together where things are working and then using this as a forum um, when things aren't quite working as well. Um, thank you to Ben and to Susan for speaking about um, the work that you're doing. Ben, thank you in particular um, about raising the, the issue around how do you include um, a line um, so that at Homerton they can collate information about young carers. It's quite clear that we're not quite out of the water yet. There's still a huge amount of work to do. Um, so Rachel, thank you for talking about universal credit. I think that you did it uh, at the last meeting as well. And um, it'd be really good if we could continue to use this forum to share information um, and to collect also feedback on where things aren't going right so that you can you can take back that back to your meetings at the DWP. Because um, that's going to be really quite crucial if we are to continue to to support residents who are on that migration pathway. Um, I, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. I know that uh, you all have a huge amount of work to do, um, but do continue to share information that John uh, shares with you here during this forum. Let us know if there's anything that we can do as cabinet members and as councillors um, and where we can um, pass on information about your organisation to our constituents and residents who we see at our regular ward surgeries um, or who might contact us by email with casework as well. Thank you very much for all of your support and uh, hope to see you all very, very soon. Thanks, Councillor Williams, and really appreciate you uh, coming along and uh, the offer to, to Ben as well, I thought was 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 great. Um, Great, I think we're going to uh, wrap up. But yeah, thanks for everyone for coming and uh, I hope we see you guys in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, yeah, thanks again, Council members, for coming. Great. You're Cheers, welcome. guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you, everyone. That was very informative. Thank you.